Well, as you can imagine, living out here where we do, internet is just not an option. It's time to give a signal boost to our cellular router. We're two hitchhikers. We met while hiking Mount Baldy with mutual friends, wasted no time, got engaged on a frozen alpine lake, got hitched, and have been adventuring together since. We're embarking on a new adventure of living big in a tiny home. Let's see how this goes. Adventure awaits. <laughs> There are no telephone lines coming this way and forget fiber. So we've been relying on cell signal this entire time. We did think about satellite as an option and our neighbors who have it say it's either really great or really terrible and we prefer to have something that is a little bit more steady. When we first moved up, we just utilized our cell phones and we used it as a hotspot to give service to our computer, which we also use as our television. Mainly we're streaming YouTube and the like. So, that was great until it wasn't because there was a data cap on it. And sometimes signal was awesome. Other times it was non-existent. So our next step in the right direction of getting internet was getting a dedicated router with its own cellular plan. Now, the great thing about that is there is no data limit on it. So we didn't have to rely on hotspotting from our phones and anything running out. Now, what we're doing is we are finally installing the antenna that we got a couple of months ago, which we hadn't been able to focus on. And we're trying to see if that signal can boost the signal that we're getting on our router. Now, prior to setting up the antenna, our signal we were getting maybe roughly about 10 megabits per second download and maybe four upload. So it was there, but it wasn't great. Now the antenna can't just go anywhere because of the high winds that we can get in this area. So Ruben has been playing around with where we can have it, where the cell signal will be good for the house and it will be in a safe location. So we think he's figured it out. Yes, we're connected, <laughs> but our signal got really bad. So now it's just the adjustment process. That means Ruben is going up on the roof and I'm down below doing speed tests. So our connection is not as strong as without the antenna up. So obviously we're pointing them in a not so great direction. So he's up trying to make a move and then he's going to stomp when he wants me to do another speed test. It was before? Yeah. 12, up, uh, 12 download, four upload, I think. 16.4 download, 7.2 upload. It's amazing how just adjusting the antenna less than one degree makes such a huge difference in our data. However, after a series of tests, we think we finally figured it out. Are you locking it in? We were happy with our final reading of 18.3 down and 11.6 up.
recall last week, we began hand harvesting our hard winter wheat. We began with threshing and decided to hold off on the winnowing until the weather cooled down a bit. Well, we are no longer in the triple digits, but we're averaging around 97 degrees, so it technically is cooler, and I'm gonna go ahead and try to winnow the wheat that we did harvest. Okay, let's pause here for a second to discuss the terms of harvesting wheat. Most of us do not farm our own wheat to make flour. So we're probably familiar with terms like threshing, winnowing, wheat berries, but what does it really all mean? This here is a wheat head on a wheat stalk in a wheat field. Each wheat head is comprised of a cluster of wheat berries, which are also known as the kernels. Now each wheat berry is enclosed in a hull, also known as the chaff. What we're after is these clean wheat berries. This is what will be milled into flour to make bread and whatever else we want to out of the flour, but it's quite the process when done manually. After harvesting the wheat, the first step is to thresh the wheat. This is the process where you separate the grain from the straw. There are so many ways in which a person can actually thresh the wheat, and it's quite interesting if you do a quick Google search to see how they do it all over the world and how they've done it for centuries without machinery. Until more recently, of course. The next step in the process is to winnow the wheat. This is where you separate the wheat berries from the chaff, usually using some kind of wind element. This is because the wheat berries are heavier than the chaff itself. And this is where I am in the process. As you can see, there's still a little bit of straw in here, but I'm gonna see if this winnowing will help separate it a bit more. I'm trying to do this process earlier in the day before it gets too hot, and there currently is no wind blowing, so I'm implementing the use of a fan. The process is definitely a lot slower than I had anticipated. I'm also finding that a lot of the separation is not occurring because more threshing actually needed to be done. A lot of these berries are still wrapped in their hull. So here I'm trying to sort of thresh and winnow at the same time by rubbing together all of the grains and hopefully all of that chaff will just blow in the wind. Now the wheat berries are falling directly down because they are heavier and the chaff is blowing away for the most part, but as you can see, there's still a lot on the blanket that I need to sort out. This is a very slow process. And of course, as I'm going through this process, I have a lot of time to think, so I can't help but think of Matthew's gospel in chapter three, where John the Baptist is talking about separating the wheat from the chaff. Of course, I'm also pondering if I should actually use this for bread or maybe make a mash. Now I've determined that I really need to put a little bit more effort in separating the wheat berries from the chaff. So I don't have a plastic bat around and I don't wanna whack anything with a two by four because I don't wanna break the berries. So I'm using this rolling and squishing method, hoping that it breaks up a little bit more. As you can see, I just keep repeating the process over and over again, and even though it's hard to tell, I can see that I am making progress. If you recall in the clip of the wheat field, we had a lot of weeds amongst the wheat. And those wheat seeds are very apparent, especially here that I'm trying to not just separate the wheat from the chaff, but the wheat from the weeds. That's the parable of the wheat and the weeds, right? In Matthew 13, where the farmer sows the wheat and the enemy plants all of the weeds there to sabotage him. These weed seeds are more difficult to separate from the wheat than the chaff. And of course, none of this straw will go to waste. Into the compost you go. And 
yes, I just keep repeating the process. So how much wheat did we actually harvest? That's not for you. No, really, that's not for you. This is cat grass, that's for you. There you go. Well, we planted 15 pounds of wheat berries and our return was almost 11 ounces. Not quite the best return. However, this is our first time and we're learning, so we can still make something. How much will this make? Well, one cup of flour is about four ounces and it takes about four cups to make an average loaf of bread. So in this case, I can make a half a loaf of bread or I could still consider making a mash. What do you think I should do? Put one in the comments if you think I should make bread. Put two in the comments if you think I should make a small batch of mash for a wit beer. Well, family, we hope you enjoyed this episode. It was sort of a balance between tech and salt of the earth manual labor. Let us know what you thought about it all in the comments below. And don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. The garden is growing, storms are brewing, and fire season is upon us. We're still safe though, so don't worry. And hey, at least our internet is a little faster now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.